The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the producers and the individuals appearing on this program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the staff of the Sun Prairie Media Center, its members or underwriters, the board members of the Media Center Commission, Charter Communications, TDS Telecom, or the staff and elected officials of the City of Sun Prairie. Hi, this is John Quinlan, and welcome to this edition of Forward Forum. I, I often say a very special edition of Forward Forum, but I think I probably mean that as much as I ever have for quite a while because I have two of my favorite people in the world, two amazing journalists who do great things, and we'll be talking about a favorite subject, and that is the 100-year history of the Capital Times, a progressive newspaper that was founded uh, in the traditions of uh, William T. Evu, Robert La Follette, back a century ago but has charted out the course of a remarkable history here in Madison, around the country, and around the world. So my guests in studio are Emeritus Editor Dave Zweifel. Uh, you, many of you folks have seen Dave on our show before, a very memorable show we did uh, talking about the life of Bob Kastemeyer two years ago, and John Nichols, who is, of course, everywhere. So you've <laughs> seen John before. Yeah. And John is currently the Associate Editor of the Capital Times, and your position with the nation right now? National Affairs Correspondent. National Affairs Correspondent, somebody you see on MSNBC, across the dial, in, in many different places, uh, but Madison being one of the favorite places to see him. Um, so we have a whole century to get to, so we're going to plunge right in. <laughs> but I think a you know, good place to start is the, the preface that our friend David Marinus wrote. And he, he just kind of charted out the course, everything from that history 100 years ago uh, to more recent developments. Um, uh, you know, I think you were born, I was born in late 1959. You were born in 60 or thereabouts? Around there, yeah. Yeah, so we're about the same age. We kind of have point. some of the same memories. Uh, Dave, just to put this in perspective, you graduated high school in 58. 58, I graduated. You were already sport. in college. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and so, so you, you have maybe a slightly different generational perspective. But, yeah. um, but you know, some of this, of course, is history. But you guys are both students of history, so we're talking about mm -hmm. it. But I think one framework for this is also to put special emphasis maybe on a couple of different years, that, that period 1917 and also uh, 1967, 68. Mm -hmm. So about the, you know, the 100th, 100th, mm -hmm. and the 50th. So, so Dave talks about uh, that era, you know, talks about both the roots of progressivism. Uh, he talks about uh, the McCarthy era, uh, both McCarthy's, both Joe and Gene. Mm -hmm. uh, he uh, then goes to some of the challenging times that the paper has faced, including the, the newspaper strike in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he remembers in 2008, a phone call he had from you, Dave, where you, you know, it could have been from the tone of your voice if we were talking about the death of a friend, but it was this transition where it was right. apparent that the Cap Times was no longer going to be a daily paper. Yeah. Um, so with all of that, where's a good place to start? <laughs> Actually, why don't we start with 2008, that, that, that day, that transition, what that meant to you? Sure. Uh, well, I, Dave uh, Marinus has always been a you know, you know, close friend of our papers. Uh, uh, of course, he actually worked in our newsroom for a couple summers uh, mm -hmm. before he uh, left college and, and went to work for WIBA as a, as a, uh, a news reporter on, uh, on our, our radio station. And we should explain who his father, Elliot Marinus, and was. His, and his dad, of course, was Elliot Marinus, uh, who at the time was the city editor of the, of the Cap Times. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and Elliot, of course, became the editor. He was the editor that I succeeded b uh, back in uh, 1983 when he retired at the age of 65. Uh, but uh, so I, I always felt a kinship with, uh, with Dave and I wanted to give him a call, let him know, hey, we're going to quit printing every day of the week uh, mm -hmm. and instead uh, go online uh, seven days a week and, uh, and also do a, a, a good solid weekly newspaper uh, that would compile a lot of this stuff, good stuff we've been doing and plus all our opinion packages. and. And uh, he but was. Was it really the death of the paper? Was it just a transition? It was a transition. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, t you know, for old journalists like myself, uh, print journalists, uh, it, it in some respects was felt like a death because, you know, uh, I still love to have that. Mm -hmm that newspaper, a print newspaper in my hand. But, but you know, it's been 10 years now, and, uh, yeah. and, and we've... 
uh, weathered this uh, this changeover quite well, and uh, and Dave continues to be an uh, integral part of it. Uh, keeps in touch. Uh, often when he gets to town, he calls and right. and we do an internship in his name, and that's it's really uh, it's, uh, you know he's a very so just, special. Just person. in case people don't know who David is, of course works with the Washington Post now, but also a right. biographer of several very important several people. Pulitzer Prize winning biographer, Fuller's, presidents, yeah. and. Yeah. and others, and, and also uh, wrote, uh, for Wisconsinites, uh, the great biography of uh, Vince Lombardi. So yeah. there would be a number of those folks, like David, who had, uh, you, know, uh, you know, had a special relationship with your newsroom, whether they worked right. there or not. I mean, I right. consider myself among that about, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, know all kinds of close friends that work there, and even though sure. I've never worked for you, I've written for you and other things, but there, mm -hmm. so relationships are really important to this folks. So go right. ahead, Dave. Well, I, I was just going to mention that, uh, you know, one of uh, David's uh, most outstanding books, in my estimation, yeah. is in Titled when uh, they marched in the sunlight, and that was a juxtaposition of what was going on here in Madison in '67 versus what was going on in Vietnam in '67. Yeah, and uh, you know the demonstrations versus the combat, and it's a, it's an incredibly well done book. And uh, if people haven't read that, I would highly recommend uh, doing so. So in a minute, I think we want to get into a bunch of juxtapositions mm -hmm. like that. What was happening in Selma? And, and across the South, what was happening in the fair housing marches back mm -hmm. in Wisconsin, right. mm -hmm. what was was happening in the kind you know in that, that Vietnam War yeah. juxtaposition. We're about to have a reunion in June of a lot of the '60s mm -hmm. protesters who were right. a part of that era, and so we're going to be remembering that. We have a current mayor who is reminiscent of that, who's running for governor, and mm -hmm. there are all these resonances with the past. Uh, the past is not past; it's all connected. It's all mm -hmm. in the same arc. I want to start in a more personal direction, and John, we'll start with you mm -hmm. and then get Dave to sure. reflect on this a little too. But wh what was your first awareness growing up in Burlington? Or your Near there, in Union Grove. Okay, um, Union Grove, sure. Yeah. But, but, you know, so as you as you were a kid in the 60s, when did you, did you become aware of kind of the capital times sure. or of all of this back then, and then what led you to the capital times itself? Well, my, my great-grandfather was the village president of Blue River from 1900 till I think, around 1937. And he was a La Follette progressive. He helped to manage... Uh, the La Follette and progressive campaigns in Western Wisconsin uh, from the turn of the century into the into the 1940s, and so when the Cap Times went into publication on December 13th, 1917, he got his subscription, and um, basically never read another newspaper. Mm. Uh, so the Cap Times was a part of our household uh, from my birth and and for 50 years, better part of 50 years before I was born. Uh, and so, you know, we knew the players, obviously. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. So, I always thought the Cap Times is more, at least in recent times, more of a Dane County paper. Yeah, I mean, that's an important, it's a, it's a subtlety of it. Uh, the way to understand the Cap Times is that it's always kind of uh, been ab above its station. And so, it, it was founded in Madison, and uh, it's very focused on Cap Times region, which is Dane County, some of the peripheral, some of the broader areas around. But the, the thing to understand is that from 1917 on, it also had a huge state presence. When it was founded, Evu, William T. Evu, the founder, was a state legislator. He was sitting in the legislature at that time. He quit to focus on the Cap Times, uh, but he was a statewide player. He was one of the founders of the Progressive Party in the 1930s, one of La Follette's closest friends. And then beyond that, the Cap Times was always a national paper. And the important thing to understand about the Cap Times as regards its national presence, and we write a lot about it in the book, is that it had it was founded as a paper fighting for the soul of the Republican Party. La Follette was a progressive. Right. The Republican Party was really the only party of consequence in Wisconsin. To give you an understanding, in the early years of the, of the Cap Times, 1922, the Democratic Party had so few votes in its primary that it lost its November ballot line. Yeah, yeah. It was a not, you know, it's basically a non-entity. There were more socialists yep. in the legislature than Democrats. And <laughs> so the great battle was for the soul of the Republican Party. La Follette, the progressives on one side, conservatives on the other. The interesting thing about the Cap Times that made it a national paper was that when those La Follette progressives began to make a transition out of the Republican Party through the Progressive Party toward the Democratic Party, Figures like Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Adlai Stevenson, Bobby Kennedy, Eugene McCarthy, uh, right up now to Bernie Sanders, became very close to the paper. They became very interested in this paper in Wisconsin right. that was challenging uh, the existing order of Midwestern politics, 
And then because it was so anti-war, challenging Democratic and Republican presidents at the national level. So I'm going to come back in a second, let you continue the yeah. arc of your personal history, but, but it's sort of like this book. It's not linear. You, you definitely go all over. No, it's not to go all that. over, though. The point, the point of the book, and this is an important yeah, yeah. thing, is that, that I've written about media now for mm -hmm. decades, and I've seen just about every book ever written about a newspaper, and they're by and large horrible. You uh -huh. know, I mean, they're like, oh, it started here in this day, and then it got the circulation. You know, it's kind of this, this you timeline. know, timeline. Right. And, and they're drab, yeah. by and large. The Cap Times was never interested in that sort of game. The Cap Times was always interested in issues. And so we divided the book, Dave and I, into a series of issue areas that we focused on. War and peace, yeah. civil rights, women's rights, gay rights. Uh, as well as the environment, uh, things going on in the state, things going on locally. But the whole concept was to kind of wrench it out of that timeline thing and give people a chance to really see a progression of a newspaper on issues. So it's an intricately woven fabric. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not linear or stuff. So, so <laughs> I, I will give you a chance. I just want to come back to one thread yeah. of what you said. And Dave, you may have some ideas in this too, but what it reminds me of, and my background is in history, it's, it's now a graduate program in oral history uh -huh. and archiving. So, so like you guys, I, I share how history relates. But um, you, as you're talking about it, what it evokes to me, uh, the granddaughter of William Allen White was one of my mom's best friends. Sure. She yeah. was the editor for a time of the Emporia Gazette. Mm -hmm. wow. And she just impressed on me when I toured their studio 30 some years ago, mm -hmm. I mean, their, their, rather their newsroom, um, uh, you know, just how much of an impact this tiny little paper in this tiny little Kansas town had oh. all over the nation and the world. And it was, it, your yeah. point so is... So just, just the other point is, yeah. is so the uh, the editor of the Edgerton paper, whose name is escaping me now, you know who I'm talking Everson? about? Everson? Yeah. 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 Diane Everson. Diane. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so I had a chance to get to know her at the Wisconsin Book Festival, uh, rather the Sterling North Book Festival, and she's going to be sitting in this chair before too long, too, because that paper is the same way. It is sure. today. Right. It's the small town paper that has this impact on progressive politics far beyond its subscription. Well, and this is the great crisis of American journalism today. American journalism, I mean, I worked for relatively large daily papers and did a lot of stuff on the East Coast and other parts of the country. The, when I got a chance to come to the Cap Times, I came immediately because the fact of the matter is that one of the biggest mistakes that people make is to think that, that what happens in Washington matters. Right. <laughs> Um, it certainly does, and it's a it's a consequence. But it doesn't matter as what as much as what happens in the great vast country out here. The flyover country. Well, it yeah. isn't though. I That's know the it thing. Isn't. And and the the critical thing the critical thing about the history of newspapers is that newspapers at one time a century ago had the ability to by shaping their states also to shape the nation. And so the Capital Times is anti-war stances throughout a hundred years have been monumentally significant in national debates to the extent that Eugene McCarthy said one of the reasons that, that he focused on Wisconsin when he ran for president in 68 was because the Cap Times was in Wisconsin. It was an anti-war paper. Similarly, you know, as you go back, when the Cap Times did recognize a need for war, which was very, very rare, uh, in 1940, 1941, when the Cap Times did advocate for fighting Hitler and yeah. fascism, yeah. Franklin Roosevelt wrote, Plaintive, lengthy right. letters complimenting the Cap Times, uh, thanking the Cap Times wow. for taking that stand. And Eleanor also had a similar thing. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll pursue those strings again, but succinctly, how did you get in the door at the Cap Times, John? I applied. <laughs> <laughs> when, about, when was that? He blew, I, yeah, go yeah, ahead. He blew my socks off. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, you were at, uh, at the, uh, blade. the, blade, the blade Toledo Blade, uh, you know, yeah. a very uh, uh, significant and well-known newspaper. Yeah. And uh, uh, at any rate, John applied for editorial page. Uh, yeah, so what date was this for approximately? 93. Uh, okay. 93 it was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I was, uh, had been editor for about 10 years, and uh, we, had, we had our editorial page editor left, uh, and uh, we needed to replace her, as I recall. Transitions around, transit, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, at any rate, uh, uh, John applied, and uh, he, di he did literally blow our socks off. And uh, we said, this is the guy we need. Because uh, he, wa he was a Cap Times guy. And, uh, I mean, he knew what, whoever he was, and he knew why the paper existed. 
And, uh, Did you know and him previously at all? Yeah, no, that's right. There was no there was no training period that okay. needed whatsoever. I'm just so curious. <laughs> had you had your paths crossed before? Or was he well, kind of did, did he blow you away? I don't it recall. You, it, it, no, not really. I, I don't think so. Not no, too much. I, although I, I, uh, I'd been out of Wisconsin, but. I, but yeah, well, you know, the reason I ask yeah. is there are probably lots of John Nichols out there that have, that paper. No, is, there are. Well, <laughs> not, no, 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 no. aside from that larger question, what I'm trying to say is there are probably lots of people that the paper has impacted in ways that you never hear about. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. and also there are a lot of people who have have chosen to associate with the paper. Right. Through the years, yeah. and that's right. one of the things that we we talk about a lot in the book. You know, Howard Zinn, the great historian, um, recalled that that you know some of the first articles he wrote. Uh, about some of the big issues in the 60s appeared in the Cap Times. Yeah. And um, the, you know, if you go back through the history, there's an uh, awful lot of national writers and national journalists who saw the Cap Times as sort of this island out in the middle of the country. And they, you know, they uh, took it seriously. Yeah, and you take, uh, go back to Watergate, for example. Right. You know, what we ran, we probably... <laughs> devoted <laughs> more, more space to Watergate than the Washington Post did. We re, we subscribed to Washington Post News Service. Well, and, actually, it was the first and, one of the and, first. And, and right, yeah. and, and we we re-ran virtually everything that Woodward and Bernstein had had uh, had written. So, so I know there's like six hours worth of questions here, but I, a yeah. brief digression: the movie The Post. What about the Pentagon Papers? Did you guys weigh in on it early on? Oh yes, oh, okay. uh, yeah, yes. very very much so. See, right. think about the one thing I've remember about the Cap Times is yeah, the Cap Times came out. We, in doing this book, there's a fascinating thing to do because we read through all the files, all the old papers. Now Dave, of course, remembered it, <laughs> you know, or <laughs> 70 <laughs> years of it, just about. But uh, but one of the fascinating things is the Cap Times didn't come out against the Vietnam War. Gulf of Tonkin or something like that. Uh -huh. Times came, was, was talking about Vietnam in like the early '60s, saying it's right. a bad thing. Don't right. go there. Right. And and so, the 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 skepticism that the Cap Times had about military adventurism, mm -hmm. you know, fed right into the Pentagon Papers and right into all that. So not not to be personal, but I was just re looking at an op-ed I placed in your paper mm -hmm. back in September based on my father's experiences working with peacemakers in Korea. Sure. And right. the thesis was, even when Kim Jong-un was pulling all the stops when it was apparent how horribly advanced their nuclear program was, I was trying to say, but peace is going to prevail. And when we look mm -hmm. at this last month, mm -hmm. peace might prevail. Mm -hmm. The careers might be reunified. Mm -hmm. No one would have guessed that. Right. But I, I am channeling, when I write something like that, the fact that I did that because I wasn't being a historical, but I was also following in the traditions of exactly what you're talking about. I was writing in a paper that got this stuff way before anybody else did. Does well, that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, if Seymour Hirsch, for example, yeah. uh, uh, mm -hmm. the Miley stuff, uh, he did this for a, a little, uh, you know, news service called Pacific News Service. Right. Uh, it wasn't you know one of the major syndicates or anything like that, and uh, and we picked it up. Uh, mm -hmm. Elliot was the editor back then, Elliot yeah. and uh, Elliot Marinus, and uh, and uh, he he immediately saw that, my gosh, this is incredible, mm -hmm. and well, everybody else was shining it as a, as a, you know some uh, greenhorn reporter, and you know who was making this stuff up. Yeah, you yeah. know one of the things too about the Cap Times that's interesting about this is that because every newspaper should have this, many don't, and it's a tragedy. But every newspaper should have sort of a, a, an internal memory, a sense, a soul, if yeah. you will. And we write about that in the book, The Notion of a Newspaper Having a Soul. And, and, and if you do, then you have memory that goes with that. And that memory tells you that, with all due respect, your government has lied to you before. Your government has gone into wars before that were not necessary. We start that with World War I. Your government has allowed people to profit off wars in obscene and horrible ways. Yep. And that knowledge that knowledge infused the Cap Times with a skepticism. That skepticism was really hit its peak, I think, during Vietnam. Like, at the, from the very yeah. beginning, the Cap Times saw this as a terrible endeavor, just as we did the, the Iraq invasion. And, and the, the weird thing about it is, it, media that, that, that isn't skeptical like that, that isn't you know, doubtful about their government and about corporate power and about elites doing bad things, you know, then they have to reinvent the wheel every time. So and the weird thing is they get it wrong. And a case in point is MSNBC, which on Iraq, the first time around got it wrong, basically threw Phil Donahue into exile because he mm -hmm. was saying unpopular things. Right. More recently, again, it's gone back and forth. Whether Oberman deserved to be kicked out or not, I don't know. But uh, but anyway, um, you know, of course, this is a, an outlet you contribute to, but sure. there's a different ethos 
because it isn't a corporate entity that's controlling it. You guys, you guys come from an entirely different place. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It makes a lot of sense. So I, I so um, we're already more than twenty minutes in. We're more third yeah, way through. Tons of time. We're going we're to. Well, you got tons of time, but <laughs> I do uh, kind of establish your backstory a little bit. Dave, when did you come to the Cap Times? <laughs> well, I came in uh, nineteen sixty-two, the day after I graduated from the University of Wisconsin Journalism School. And I, I, during your college career, you've told me before you were very involved in the Democratic Party. So Pat Lucy and Dave Obey and other people. Were right, I, I was a, a member of the Young Dems back in those yeah. days, uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Obi and I and uh, a number of the Obi's other, were uh, our neighbors uh, when I was four years old. Oh, is that right? In Wausau. Yeah. In Wausau. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. They, you know, that George McGovern. That's when he was a Joe McCarthy guy. Yeah, no, he came back to. <laughs> oh, anti Joe McCarthy. He yeah, yeah, came yeah. back to Madison yeah. three yeah. years ago for the George McGovern benefit, and he told me at the doors because he, he loved my mom and dad, and that was kind of cool. Oh, that was good. Yeah, cool. and I, plus, yeah. I worked with him in '92 yeah. on the campaign. But anyway, but I mean, but yeah, deeper story. Goes back to uh, when so high school. We'll, we'll come. We'll come back to it. Okay, go ahead. D oh, well, D I actually the, the <laughs> my uh, love for the Cap Times yep. began when I was a kid. Uh, you know, I was uh, in Glarus on the farm. Yep. And my grandpa was a huge progressive. I mean, he. Uh, and he credited Franklin D. Roosevelt for. This is outside of Mount Horeb? No, New New Glarus. New Glarus, New Glarus. Me. I'm sorry, yeah. Run Dutch town. Okay. I'm Swiss. Run town. Yeah, okay. Ev is a Norwegian. I'm a, yeah, I'm, yeah, a, yeah. I'm a Swiss guy. So, <laughs> anyhow. Not the, that, uh, that makes you a lesser. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, uh, uh, my grandfather credited FDR with saving his farm. Yeah, because uh, that's when the banks were all coming out, mm -hmm. you know, foreclosing and back during the depression, and, and then of course FDR was elected and and saved uh, tens of thousands well, of farmers. Just from, a quick aside: this is know. very reminiscent of Mike McCabe telling his growing up story in Correct. Clark County, yeah, mm -hmm. up in, and uh, how Clark, Clark County, County went from yeah. being a very Democratic supporter because of the New Deal, because of FDR, right, exactly. because of the GI yeah. Bill, et cetera. Yeah. We drifted away from that. Right, and of course, uh, William <laughs> T. Evans, Capital Times, was yeah. you know, right up his alley. And uh, we didn't get home delivery and a farm back in those days, so we had to drive into town every afternoon and pick up a copy at the local drugstore. Uh -huh. uh, but at any rate, I devoured the Cap Times for the time I was probably in sixth or seventh grade. And, and I started my own little newspaper down there, and uh, oh, my, really? a weekly paper that I uh, actually printed by hand, and then I uh, eventually learned how to type, and then my dad bought me a, a mimeograph machine, so I was turning oh, out wow. these papers every Friday. But uh, And he was getting ads? I was getting and ads, yeah. had decent circulation? This was a real I, newspaper. I, I actually got up to 200 circulation. So you, you were the Doogie Hauser of journalism. That's that correct, yeah. Ahead of your time. Okay. But I used to send Mr. Evu a copy of my paper yeah. every week, and uh, you know, I was Deviously, I figured, man, maybe he'll notice me, you know. <laughs> so, and he did. And uh, cool. he sent a reporter down to interview me, and they did a story about uh, my printing of this little paper and modeling it after the Capital Times. And, right. Uh, and then I got invited up to see him, and uh, personally, at, 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 at coming to Madison from New Glarus back in those days was a huge deal. Wait, how long did ever you live? Until 1970. Yes, okay, so he, he died in 1970. Yeah, okay. he was, oh, yeah. yeah. So I was, I would have been, this was like in 56 or so. Okay. So uh, at any rate, uh, uh, I sat down with him and had this great conversation and he taught me, you know, all the his reasons for his viewpoints and so forth and was uh, extremely proud of me that I was, you know, following in his footsteps. And he said, what are you going to do after high school? I said, well, I'm going to go to college. He said, well, after you're out of college, come see me. Okay. But you went to the military after college, right? Well, I, it, it, there's, a, uh, there's a little nuance to all that. I, okay. uh, I was an ROTC guy. Uh, you right. know, I went through ROTC at campus. So that, but anyhow. So just, I'm sorry, just to pick up this briefly. So when I interviewed you about Kennedy, you right. were in Oklahoma in an Army base when the assassination when he was occurred killed, in yes. November of 63. He was that already at correct. the cap time. But you, were at, you had an association had, with yeah, he, You were phoning in what uh, you could get on the ground correct, there from there. Correct, right, yeah. Okay. I, uh, uh, I, my call update to go on active duty was like nine months from the time I graduated. And mm -hmm. So I went to see Mr. Evu at his house, and I um, and he had no idea who I was. He said, you know, he had he, forgotten. For maybe this, well, it was five, six years since we sure. had this conversation. He probably talked to, you know, thousands of people since then. But at any rate, uh, uh, I told him, you told me to come and see you when I, uh, you know, graduate. And, uh, 
he says, well, if I said that, I guess I'll have to hold true to my word. So he, there you go. <laughs> so he sent me down in the uh, newsroom and had him put me on the payroll. And then they you know, weren't very excited in the newsroom. <laughs> so just just briefly, the arc then of when did, did you become a city editor at some point? How did yes, you, how did yeah, you, okay. I uh, actually uh, I worked at the Cap Times for nine months. Uh, they gave me a two year leave of absence to go on active duty. I came back and uh, in nineteen uh, after Mr. Revue passed away, I became a city editor and. Uh, and then in uh, 78, the managing editor, and then 83, I uh, took Elliot's place as the editor. Okay. And when did Elliot come on the scene? Elliot came in 58. Okay. Yeah. So you, you, you were immediately working with him throughout all this time? Yes. Oh, yeah. Elliot was, uh, in fact, I sat across from him as a reporter. Okay. We, we, yeah. we, uh, we uh, shared a, a desk, uh, bank of desks together, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. You, you explained this, but so he was... It, Fairly shortly on the managing editor, or what? Uh, Elliot, yeah, Elliot was, was city editor uh, 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 prior to me. Uh, he, uh, Mr. Evy promoted uh, Cedric Parker, who was uh, an old legend in our newsroom, to managing editor, and okay. Elliot took the city editor. But he, he was an important mentor to you in some ways. He was sort of one step ahead. You often yes. followed. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Elliot, well, Elliot was. I learned a, a lot from Elliot. Yeah. And, uh, it's and a, his, it's a, very tenacious journalist. There's also a deeper thing with Elliot too, which is a really big deal. And you know, the Capital Times was, from its founding, committed to civil rights and to women's empowerment. It was a, it, its commitments were good, but the the look of the Cap Times newsroom well into the '60s was a bunch of white guys. Yeah. And what Elliot did meticulously yeah. was really go out of his way to hire young women and people of color onto the staff. And so it, to make real the the commitments of the paper in its in its staff. And uh, the dynamism of, of Eliot's contribution, yeah, you can see it in all the writing he did, which was great, and in the stories he assigned, which were great. But it was also he was a transformational figure in, you know, the physical makeup of the newsroom. In way and that again put the Cap Times way ahead of other newspapers yeah. in there. I mean, and there are a lot, I mean, we can't mention all the names here, but I'm, and Phil Hasslanger, I think, also continued that commitment to diversity and Absolutely. supporting. Absolutely. Uh, right. Uh, well, so basically like, like everybody. Like Sean felt very yeah. supported by Phil, you know, yeah. as one of the only few people right. of color in the newsroom. Right, but right. everybody, this yeah. is the, weir the interesting thing. Yeah. Elliot started that, um, and in fact, it, Phil got hired in around, as a, Phil was hired in as a very young guy, mm -hmm. and this is the other thing. It, during that period, you had a ton of very young mm -hmm. staffers, many of whom would come right out of the campus, right out of that 60s right. period on campus, and here they were writing for a daily paper. And that had a profound impact on the Cap Times in you know its coverage of the, the big issues of the day that made all the news, but also in its exploration of new issues. The Cap Times was writing about gay rights in the 70s in a big way. And not always perfectly, not always as much as you'd like, but, but it was... But just back right, yeah. 1975, Madison, one of the first cities in the country to have yep. an equal opportunity ordinance for gay people, like Paul Soglin and Jim Wright being instrumental in that. Some of the first... Ni 1982, the first elected. statewide rights yeah. law, seven yeah, years yeah. before. And, and then more openly gay and lesbian elected officials from Dick Wagner to Mark Bocan to Tammy Baldwin. Right. In all, we are the only congressional district in the country that has a gay man and a lesbian representative in the House. And a gay man Senate. succeeding right. a lesbian. Exactly. Right. And, but then here's the, yeah. the interesting thing of that. Um, I wouldn't give the Cap Times a tremendous amount. I wouldn't overcredit the Cap Times for that. I mean, I think that that was a part of the dynamism of the city and the people who came here and, and a lot of other things. But to have a daily newspaper during that period that was saying, this is a good thing. That is somewhat different than other places. Well, let me, let me just continue this arc just a little further. So, um, so uh, Ron McRae being essential mm -hmm. to this. Yes. Ron McRae being the first openly gay press secretary to a governor, to Tony Earl, and obviously someone who has a history with you guys too, and, and a history in the, in the LGBT rights movement. Brooks Edgerton, who's one of my best friends, sure. um, right. who was this, uh, eventually an assistant city editor mm -hmm. in the late 80s, who went on to do great things in mm -hmm. Dallas. Mm -hmm. Spotlight, that was about 10 years after a lot of the stuff that he did, and a similar mm -hmm. as an investigative reporter there. But Brooks 
Um, and, you know, actually Joyce Daly at the State Journal uh, at about the same time, there were openly LGBT people that mm -hmm. were influencing the culture of journalism, not only at Madison newspapers, but also across the country that are significant to this. The other thing, on a very personal note, and I can't help it to be very personal, the fact that you came along, John, in 1993 was very, very important for a young woman named Soul Kelly Jones, my niece, who I was living with at the time, and her family, and helping raise her. Because when she was 10 years old, she burst onto the scene. You covered uh, what she had done. She spoke at this amazing hearing up in Wausau that occurred that the right wing decided to hold in Wausau because nobody who cared about gay rights would come there. And yet the room was filled with people, including a 10-year-old soul, her feet dangling, talking about the Constitution, mm -hmm. talking about her mom and dads, and the darn it all, you legislators, I've got just as every right, much right as anybody else to have my family represented by you. And you wrote about that in compelling terms. You went into their home. So I guess I say, you know, I say this in a couple different frames. You know, first of all, the LGBT rights movement is directly connected to you guys mm -hmm. because storytelling is what got us gay marriage, what got us everything it was else. It's part of it. But, but can, you, can you just reflect briefly well, on it? Well, yeah, obviously, you know, Soul's story is a, a remarkable story in Wisconsin because she was uh, a very young woman who was so poignant in how she spoke about her family. And her moms, who are still around, still active in so town. So John Jones and Joanne Kelly, yeah. yeah. Uh, were, you know, they, they were more than capable of speaking for themselves. But the fact that they had raised this child who could speak so well. And it was really a, a powerful intervention at that moment. And the interesting thing about it, too, is it's a way to talk about the Cap Times. And I think, it's, I think you'd agree, Dave. The Cap Times actually is always looking for that story, yeah. right? Uh, you know, some newspapers yeah. stumble into it and they'll do it, you know, stuff like that. The Cap Times has has always, I should say, maybe not perfect, there's flaws along the way, of course, but the Cap Times generally is like, wow, there's a 10-year-old kid who's speaking up for LGBTQ rights? Let's go for that. That's a, that's a good story. And just briefly, yeah. two years later, was speaking before 500,000 people in the National Mall, Absolutely. a National March, winning national right. awards, started Crowd Theater, which is still going, et cetera, et cetera. But no, I, I think the article that you did, I can still picture it. I still have it. It was on the front page of the feature section. Actually, was a catalyst for people in our community understanding the significance of this young woman and her story. But I think that also led to national stories and other things. Oh, yeah. So let me just, Dave, you may have a natural... Think this, but the other person who comes to mind, who was a, you know, in, a, in a different, more public realm of, of an older generation, but had also this amazing story to tell, was Midge Miller. You know, so here mm -hmm. Midge was. You know, we're we're both Methodists, and she grew up in a Methodist missions connected family, as did I. Mm -hmm. And and you know, just you know, Mark and, and and many of her siblings are good friends. So so it's there's a story of, of Midge, but also a story of the next generations. But in the 1960s. What she was doing was essential as one of the first women legislators, but also someone who was really important to Gene McCarthy and Correct. his yeah. his arc that, of course, led to the resignation, essentially, of a president. That's right. So, can you reflect a little on Midge? And who well, she was Midge, of course, was a uh, you know the prime example of a very dedicated peacenik. I mean, she believed that uh, war was the most atrocious thing that we could possibly do as a, as a nation and she wanted to ban get nuclear weapons banned and and she worked her butt off trying to you know uh, I don't think she spent an hour of a day which she didn't think about this right and uh, uh, she immediately became one of our favorites uh, you know and she, and she used us a lot I mean she'd come to see us and she'd you know, Did you uh, know how to ask it to ask, twist people's yeah, arms? Ask it. Don't in you the think best you way, right? <laughs> don't you think you ought to write an editorial about this, or you know things like that? And of course, we uh, we covered her quite. Uh, she and Mary, Mary Lou Montz, uh, you know, right. and that, that that whole it group was a back West in those days. Yeah, they right. Go there was two of them, and then later, and right. Mary Lou Montz's daughter is a good friend of mine, yeah. so I've heard of this too. Yeah. But, but also, you know, some Becky Young and other other people. And kind Becky of, Young, she. Uh, yeah. But but Mitch, you know, was uh, she was one of the few in town at when the Vietnam War protests began, that actually stood up for the, for especially the kids at the university. And, uh, and, she, and she was this very dignified Very dignified, yeah, you know, correct, looked, right. So, right. you know, here you had, you know, the, the young, very young people from the campus, and then there's this woman from the west side of Madison saying, yeah, yeah. these guys are right. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Eugene McCarthy credited her with, because she opened the McCarthy headquarters in, in yeah. Madison, credited her with really, you know, getting that Wisconsin campaign to a level that right. then when he came into Wisconsin, 
he was able to hit the ground running so hard that that Linda Johnson quit the race. Yeah. And but the thing about uh, the other thing about Midge especially was that Midge then did what a lot of people in Madison did, which is a fascinating thing. Uh, and you start to run down this list of, you know, like Paul Sogland is another example of it, of these people who were in the anti-war movement who amazingly, wonderfully, had enough hope in the system to go into politics. And Midge got elected in 1970, I believe, to the state legislature. Sogland got elected 68 to the city council, then 73 ran to the mayorship, 73. I think. Yep. And, and the interesting thing about this is, is here you have these people coming out of, out of movements in the streets, activists, getting into politics. And the, inter the, the striking thing is that you had a newspaper in town, the Cap Times, that didn't say, well, there's an old establishment. We don't want these new people coming along. The Cap Times passionately backed Midge for the legislature. Yeah. And the Cap Times passionately backed Sogland for mayor. And, and why that was important was because 1960s, Madison, it took me years to figure this out, was not a liberal bastion. It was run by very conservative people, right. very minor. Bill Dyke who, was a mayor. Who were still <laughs> trying to declare that Frank Lloyd Wright was some kind of a radical oh. and, <laughs> and immoral and all this other stuff. No wonder the Monona Torres took forever to get elected. So, I mean, you, you were, it was, it, you, it, you weren't planning on fertile ground. You were really, well, it, I mean, you were in the sense that the people were behind you, but the powers right. that be we're, we're, we're going in a very different direction. Right. So, so to use this analogy comes to mind. So the Midge Millers, the Paul Sogans of the world, all the other stories you told, it's just like the, uh, the tree that falls in the forest. If no one reports on it or tells its yeah, story, yeah. it doesn't right. matter. Right. You know? A young and, and Eugene Park. Right. Yeah, and, and but I, gee, yeah. yeah, for example. And, uh, uh, but I think that was one of the, uh, uh, the magic of the Cap Times was the people like Elliot Marinus who hired people who would go cover mm -hmm. the stories like that because you know part of a uh, uh, the most impact a newspaper can have i believe is not necessarily its editorials and stuff like that it's what it actually its newsroom goes out decides what to cover yeah mm -hmm. and there are so many things that we fail as a press to cover as a, you know as, as newspapers across the country and uh, you know just to, to do the uh, for example elliot uh, hired uh, Two young guys, right out of right out of college, uh, in during the '60s, and they all were friends of people who were involved in the anti-war movement. The, the kids who were demonstrating the uh, uh, and and what was behind all that. So we were doing stories about you know these these kids putting a human face on who they were and why they were doing what they were doing. That, Otherwise, it was just those that an old guy, kids, right. those, those troublemakers, mm -hmm. exactly. those delinquents. Yeah. But, but that, if you're an old, uh, you know, veteran reporter, well, you don't know these guys. You right, know? right. So it's a. Uh, it turned out to be. Uh, that was one of the, what I consider to be sort of the magic of our newsroom. And it created also this wild interaction in town. The Cap Times did cover the anti-war movement. It did cover the civil rights movement. It covered all these other movements in intensive ways. The environmental movement as it rose. Yep. But the interesting thing was. It wasn't just cheerleading. And when we were doing the book, one of the most fascinating things, boy, Paul Soglin, who we really championed at a certain point, man, so his letters to the other, no, 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 he, right. he would write these long screens about how yeah. horrible the Cap Times was because there were differences. People didn't always agree. And, On and the left, really? Yeah, but this is also <laughs> in the broader sense. But the thing was the Cap Times covered the left. Yeah. Seriously enough. That you had that interaction right. instead of just you know that there was a wall between these things and and where that ended up was that eventually when paul ran for mayor in 73 at the uh, age of 27 27 yeah um the cap times endorsement was a critical endorsement it was a vital endorsement oh it was uh, I, he he at the time did say that you know our, our endorsement pulled him over the top but uh it, which it did it was uh and it's probably fair it to say legitimized that, him yeah and it's probably uh, fair to say that it did yeah. again in 2011. So one, one, <laughs> one, one frame for understanding all this, of course, is to juxtapose the history of the Cap Times with the folks yeah. across the hall at the State Journal. Now, um, Paul Fanlon's going to sit in that seat, and we're going to talk more about what happened since 2008 and where things have gone forward. Right. But I interviewed him right after he got the job, and, and, and the conversation advanced, so I don't mean to put him in a whole, in a, in a, in a difficult place, but... One of the things I was just asking about, what it meant for him to make the transition from the State Journal to the Cap Times, and one of the things he essentially said is, well, 
it may matter in terms of the editorial side, but not so much about the news side. We are objective journalists, and essentially what we do at the Cap Times is the same as the State Journal. Now, I mean, the nuance is much more complicated than that, but what I was trying to argue is, but the choices you make in what news you cover yeah, are substantial. That's my whole The histories point, yeah. of these two papers right. are substantially different in the impact right. you had. Right. Even though it was objective, quote unquote, Correct. journalism you're doing, and I, I don't mean to diminish it by putting quotes around it, but I mean, you can do objective journalism, but the choices you make are very different ones. Yeah, that's, the, that's the whole difference, of, uh, in my estimation, of, of the two papers in Madison. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so, but to ju so again to carry the narrative forward in the 1950s, well, let's actually carry it back a little bit. So there, there was a point in the 1940s when the Cap Times was actually more of the dominant news presence in terms of subscribers. Right. Right. But that was a time when afternoon papers were where we got their news. A actually, the Cap Times became the dominant paper shortly after Ev you founded it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was uh, in the 20s it, uh, it had oh, yeah. overtaken yeah. the State Journal. And, and the, the reason the why you yeah. were down to I think 10,000 or so subscribers, you know, when the paper, when the pa physical about paper eight, ended. About 18,000. Yeah. Okay, 18,000. Yeah. But but you know, in mark contrast to the State Journal, which also then had the Sunday paper and everything. Right. W w was was not about the quality of the paper. It was it was a morning versus an afternoon issue. paper. Afternoon paper when Walter Cronkite came in and other things, yeah. they were no longer the place where people got their news. So, so anyway, so, so that, that, that kind of explains how the two papers kind of crossed right. in terms of their influence. But, but it, so you can answer that, but the other thing is, let's talk about the McCarthy era and mm -hmm. how they championed Joe McCarthy, and you guys obviously took a very different perspective. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> John wrote uh, most of the McCarthy stuff, wow. in which uh, uh, is, you know, still, uh, I think, what we're most noted for, for in this, this hundred year history. Uh, and, and we do devote a lot of uh, space to, to that in our book. Uh, uh, Joe McCarthy was a demon, and, uh, and if you saw that in, in the, right after the war, when he came back and uh, tried to, uh, you know, leverage his war record and why he should be elected and, you know, things like that. And, mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course, he wound up beating uh, young Bob LaFollette. Which we didn't like Which very uh, much. Mr. Avery yeah. didn't like at all. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, anyway, we started well, doing exposés yeah, so on we, him we, back there then. There are all these parallels, and we, we, we may not have time to go back to the parallels with 1917, Wisconsin. And right. this is, but, but there was, yeah. The 1950s, right. Wisconsin, you know, I, I, again, talking to McCabe recently, I'm going to talk to all the governor's candidates if my project goes forward here. But, but you know, but what, what he kept on talking about was the changes that occurred. And he began their interviews saying, I mean, Wisconsin's kind of gone to hell in a handbasket. And I just kind of immediately interjected, Mike, I know this because I know you're talking about You're not saying that the people of Wisconsin have. You're saying the government doesn't reflect who we are. And in the 1950s, our government was reflecting this very oppressive, McCarthy-like, uh, paranoid, not forward-looking, very self-serving, materialistic view of the world that was not necessarily right. in keeping with other folks. Mm -hmm. But but you went to high school in that era. You, you saw the transition. The, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make with our limited time is that there was something that happened in the 50s that was followed by a resurgence, a renewal, a renaissance, so that six years after 1957, Gaylord Nelson was in office, Pat Lucy was in office, or, or rather on the arc and everything. Sure. So, so I'm just trying to say, you know, is there a well, parallel there with that path? Right. A lot of things on the table here. I know. <laughs> um, no kidding. <laughs> including the comparison with the, the State Journal. And and I think what distinguishes the Cap Times, many people make the mistake of thinking that the, the distinction between the Cap Times is simply that the Cap Times is on the left. Mm -hmm. the Cap Times has always historically been very uncomfortable with the word liberal because we think of liberal as kind of soft. The uh. Cap Times has always been a progressive paper. Have you referred to it as radical and militant in his own columns? No, in recent times, progressive. Like in yeah, the they've softened it down. Well, but, no, that's but, the, but it's also, it's also, yeah, it's, I, yeah, I think you're right. It, yeah. It's been seen in turn as something that is milk toast, but it's also a very white well, liberal they, motion. Look, the right. no, no, I don't, don't want to get into just, semantics. I just want to say yeah. this is a constant effort to figure out what we are. Because I mean, when I, I'm sorry, just a brief tangent, but when we were doing stuff on the mic, I resented the notion that I was a liberal talk show host. What I was trying to do is I was telling the stories, bringing in voices that hadn't been heard. It seems like that's a lot of what you're well, trying to do. Well, the thing is, the Cap Times was proudly on the left. Yeah. But the thing, as an editorial, so right. the news side, it, more balanced. But the Cap Times was proudly on the left. Um, but there's more than that. Yeah, there is something more, and this is what it is. is the Cap Times was, was willing to take on battles where nobody else was with us. Uh, when the Cap Times defended La Follette, in 1917, 1918, when the Cap Times took on the Klan in the in the 20s, uh, these were somewhat lonely positions when the Cap Times took on McCarthy in the 50s, 
And, and one of the things that was said, and we read about it in the book, uh, an observer from uh, St. Louis, a uh, guy who was at the Post-Dispatch down there, observed papers across the country and said, the Cap Times has sort of developed this unique muscle, right? It has the ability to go into a fight knowing that it, it could get beat up, that it's going to be lonely. Um, and as a result, that, that muscle tissue, that, that strength, which exists to this day, has allowed the Cap Times to not buy into the sort of status quo, mainstream, simple consensus. Now, the State Journal, which is a paper with some really good people on it, and they do good journalism, and it's to be defended on many, many levels, but the State Journal has, has historically been the sort of status quo, the, the sort of mainstream, corporate, somewhat conservative consensus. And so if you go back 100 years, right, the Cap Times was with La Follette, State Journal was against him. The Cap Times was ready to take on McCarthy. The State Journal strongly supported him. The Cap Times was anti-war. The State Journal was much more supportive of the war. And you come right up through you know, George Bush and Scott Walker. The papers deviated. But it isn't just a, a left-right split. It is also whether there's a newspaper that's willing to say, look, as I think the Cap Times does, we have some experience here. We actually know about this stuff. We're not just like reinventing it this week and saying what's, what people want to hear this week. And as a result, we've often taken exceptionally lonely stands, not just in Wisconsin, but nationally. And so I wouldn't bang away on the State Journal. So what I would, no, just let me finish this thought. No, I again. will for sure. But I wouldn't bang away on the State Journal because I don't think the State Journal is that different than a lot of other newspapers. I agree. What I would suggest is there was a thing called the, Evu did this, this thing in the start of his book that he wrote in, in the late 60s. <laughs> Evu ran through all the papers around the country. And he said, you know, here's where these people aren't doing their job. Here's where these people aren't doing it. Yeah. And, and Evu really did see the Cap Times as different than all other no, papers. papers yeah. So just a quick yeah. observation. So, so if you give the State Journal due credit. I think it became much more moderate over time. And, and yeah. uh, so here are two people that come to mind. Joyce Daly, mm -hmm. first her journalism, and then her editorial role. Doug Erickson recently, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the great series they did on homelessness, he and Dean Mosman did. And, and you know, so they're examples. And they've, always, and they've done great environmental writing over the years. Look, this, <laughs> is, this, is, what, this is the point, is people who get into that yeah. simple game of saying, oh, we like this paper, we don't like that paper. Uh, our view is that the State Journal, I think it's safe to say, is a, is a more typical paper. So in, the, oh, yes. in, in right. the arc of history, Dr. King was not a popular guy. No. Dr. King he was with stands. us. We he was him. with you. <laughs> but uh, more recently, uh, so, um, uh, when, you know, so when Bill Keyes took a stand at the school board right after 9-11, that we should not employ, we should not make it um, that people have to say the pledge. Virtually all of the liberal establishment. They wanted to did, hang him. They wanted to hang him. <laughs> and, or or uh, Mark Miller was way ahead of the game of, of almost everybody I interviewed, even 10 or 11 years ago, about gay marriage. And just saying unequivocally, of course it's the right thing to do. Right. Where a lot of those people had, well, I'm for equal rights and domestic partnership, but I don't know if I can go so far as marriage. Mm -hmm. I mean, even our president took a long way to come around. Yeah, so I our, have our a special admiration president. for the folks that took the stand before it was popular. And you're right. That's what you guys have done. Well, and that's... Yeah, I mean, I, we can yeah. belabor it, but, and Dave was there for some of these fights. It wasn't always easy, and especially calling Madison out on civil rights. Yeah, but that's, that was, but that's, that's, a, big that's issue, a kind that's of integrity a, that transcends ideology. Yeah. That says you saw what, what the founding fathers had in mind for the fourth estate, what, what you talk about and people get ready and all this other history. Mm -hmm. The press has to not just buckle into the corporate powers that own them, the shareholders, mm -hmm. or, or, or the consensus of the moment. They can't just stick their finger to the wind and figure out what the popular will is. They have to be willing to lead and establish what, what these yeah. principles are. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as John alluded to, we, uh, you know, one of the things we did in the late 80s was uh, this real up close investigation of discrimination in Madison. Yeah. And how it was virtually impossible for a black couple to rent an apartment, and it it was a real eye opener. And now today, thirty years later, we're saying, well, really, we have we have a problem here, <laughs> and it's uh, you know it it's our duty as a newspaper to take these unpopular topics and uh, and actually show people, hey, this isn't the rose colored. Uh, place that we sometimes think it well, is. Yeah, to, so Paul, to his credit, has really embraced this. He's Correct. Yes, he has. He, he's done things. Uh, but he's also, I think, acknowledged 
that it's tough to be a white ally in these settings because understandably people are angry. This is volatile stuff. This is it difficult is. stuff. It is. Yeah. It, so, so anyway, but um, but as opposed to say a Chris Rickert, and I will bring him up briefly, who sort of says the everyman, you know, is is the one who's really you know white guys are the ones who face the real discrimination and stuff. And he's more complicated than that, but. But anyway, you know, it's a real difference in terms of what you're right. getting. But I remember yeah. when Phil uh, helped me write an op-ed in the 80s when I was the president of the Fair Housing Council mm -hmm. at a Soglin mm -hmm. like 26 or 27 mm -hmm. that said this Equal Rights Division study has just said a third, a fully a third of the people who rent apartments are facing mm -hmm. discriminatory behavior. Well, Nobody wanted to believe that. No. And, and this and is where the Cap Times went out and proved right. with, we, the, we went with the, the, I was just going to say, so the yeah. testing, we took a black you couple and a white yeah. couple, and they both went all over the county. So trying Brooks, to rent Brooks's places. partner, Will Lyon, yeah. who, mm -hmm. who, was, who was then our, our executive director, worked very closely with you guys. So, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so you, yeah, had, yeah. you had pairs yeah. of black and white reporters that went out that did the right. same kind of testing right. we did. Yeah. And it was this wonderful 16-page supplement that I don't think is really like anything that most papers have ever done. And we did write about in a book quick. Oh, do you? Okay, cool. And Phil has. Hasslinger, who is, it went on to become a pastor here in town. But Phil gets a lot of credit in there because one of the things that Phil did was that when the, the reporters went out and revealed this story, if you read Phil's editorials, they were, they were scorching. They were, they were and, and Phil's one of the sweetest guys in the history of the world. Exactly. But they were <laughs> unforgiving. They were basically saying, look, this, this is, we really have to look at this. This can't stand, yeah. Yeah, and, and. So I think that, you know, there's this, this, this question of, of, you know, it'd be nice to sit here and say the Cap Times got everything right and it was just perfect all the way through. <laughs> it's a different thing than that. I think the Cap Times was late to some things. I think the Cap Times was imperfect in some ways. However, the rest of media was so bad yeah. and so weak that the Cap Times, it, we like to, we tell a story that, that we don't feel as embarrassed by because there were times where... Yeah. And I think you're authentic and accountable about the journey that you took. You were in the wrong place, but you opened your minds to the folks Along who came the way, pounding at so. your door. Yeah. I mean, the other, the other image I have sometimes in Madison newspapers with the fence and the, the, you know, the barriers you have to go to sometimes get into <laughs> your newsrooms there, and you guys try to break that down. You get out of the community to transcend that. But it is really hard for those of us who see those realities and are ahead of the curve of popular mm -hmm. opinion mm -hmm. to sometimes get the press's attention. Oh. And yeah. you guys made an effort to do that. Yeah, but not always to, perfect. To, to, which, yeah, yeah, always that's perfect. all I'd say. But, is, no, but, I mean, it's, yeah. Just to, to punctuate that, though, but that, that actually adds a, even more credibility to what you did because you could admit that you were wrong. You didn't dig in your heels and say, we're going to be this way forever. You're mm -hmm. going to say the story is evolving, and you, mm -hmm. you allowed the story to evolve. And one of uh, Mr. Evie's, uh mantras was, you know, if somebody is, disagrees with us, Oh yeah, or or uh, you know, uh, writes us and says you guys are so full of baloney that you know, you know it's hard to tell you where you're coming from. He would print those letters and uh, sometimes it, right up front, sometimes <laughs> in the front page. Right and then of course, if he felt strongly about it, he'd answer them. <laughs> and, and that's John. That's one of the critical things. It's sort of like what you try to do with this show, and some a lot of things you've tried to do in the community. Um, Ebu, there's something about Ebu that was just incredible. He he used to require reporters to pass a pass a notepad around at meetings and have everybody write their name down. And so you'd go to a community meeting, and everybody who wanted to wrote their name down. And then at the end of Cap Time Stories in the 50s and the 60s, you know, even going back and further. Going back further, yeah. It would list all the names. Yeah. Many people, you know, like, like if you showed up at a meeting, yeah. you were in the paper. Yeah. And, and that, yeah. that broke down a lot of those barriers. Yeah, the uh, you do a story about the Rotary Club meeting, and they don't uh, give a few paragraphs what the speaker said. And then among those in attendance were colon and <laughs> <be> paragraphs, <laughs> or, or they would go out. They, they, oh, which is what small town papers, what the weekly right. papers so are still got, around do. Yeah, that's at really their best. Important. At yeah, their best. Very important. I'm very going back important. to New London recently. They they still had on their files the story when the Quinlans moved to town. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's yeah. kind of cool. Well, you know, yeah. a great newspaper in Wisconsin, the Kenosha News. Um, they used to, they, when I was growing up, I, I lived for a good deal of my growing up years in southeast Wisconsin. They had a thing called Kenosha Kernels. No. Oh. K E R N A L S. Yeah. And, and it was this big page of stuff. And it would be like Dave Zweifel's aunt came to visit <laughs> over the weekend. <laughs> and it was all this human stuff. And, and you see, one of the things is the Cap Times has taken stunningly bold stands on issues through the years. And we continue to do so um, today on Trump and on net neutrality and on 
you know, a hundred other issues. And, and I think we continue to be as bold as we've ever been on our editorial page. But if that's all you do, right, if you just take bold stance and they're disconnected from the reality in the community, what people are going through, then it's, it's more talk than it is the fundamentals. So we're at, I think, essentially our 10-minute warning. So in keeping with that, and I do this, I forgot to do this today, but about two and a half years ago, you guys gave this program a $5,000 grant, meaning the EVU Foundation did. Mm -hmm. But to talk about the concrete ways that you're not just a newspaper, but you have this other effect, that's probably the most prescient notion. Now, some of that should be talked about briefly in terms of structure, that you, essentially the profits from your paper, a lot of them go into this foundation. That's Correct. very unusual. Yep. It reminds me a little bit of the different model, for example, of St. Pete's Times yes. follow as a nonprofit place. But profit isn't what's motivating you. You are producing what you do, in fact, to have this larger effect on the community. So what has that meant in terms of the Ebby Foundation? Well, it's, it's uh, of course, been uh, remarkably uh, lucrative for the nonprofit community in, in, in our area. There are more nonprofits in Den County uh, than, than anywhere else. Than any place <laughs> <That's right>. else. <laughs> for better but, or for worse. Uh, it was, uh, Mr. Ebby, Mr. Ebby was not known as a uh, very, uh, uh, as a man who was loose with his money. He okay. was, he, he, he uh, was what we would call in the old days very tight, you know. Fru to, to he was also not frugal. confused with a sweet and gentle soul. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's a little bit. He's a yeah, top edge. Were he and right good friends because they sound very, very, oh, they were very good, good friends. friends. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I, think I, I mean, Mr. Evans paid okay. his bills. No question about that. Yeah, he had yeah. to, but uh, but he was quite. Which Mr. Wright did not. But at any rate, in his will, he decides that hey, these people in Dane County have been very kind to the Cap Times. Okay. They've kept it going and they saved me in 1917 from, uh, so, uh, you know, from sure death. So and this started in 1970 or thereabouts. Now, I, I thought it was something that was present throughout uh -huh. the history of the paper. No, no, no. It, uh, okay. Actually, he, he founded, he uh, formed the foundation before he died, uh, okay. but not very long before he died. And he used to give away just a little, you know, five or six thousand dollars here and there. Uh, and, and it's now much. a million and a half, two million. Uh, like that, uh, this last year, we gave away a little over two million dollars. Uh, the overall figure over the years. Yeah, it's about fifty-eight million dollars since wow. uh, since he passed away. And uh, uh, at any rate, uh, the the money that the Evie Foundation gets is the stock. Is the, or the dividends from the stock that Mr. Evie owned. He had the majority stock, obviously, in the paper. And then he formed a charitable trust, which is uh, uh, run by five trustees, and we control the, those, those Evie shares. So yeah. briefly to juxtapose, the equivalent of the state journal in this situation is most of philanthropy is really to maintain the status quo. Um, you know, the, yeah. the Rockefeller Foundation, well, not, that's a bad example, but the the really large philanthropical foundations are in supporting institutions. You know, they're doing valuable work, or they're yeah. doing, you know, more social work. Uh, you know, uh, or rather, they're 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 funding social programs rather than funding social change. Right. I used mm -hmm. to be the president of Wisconsin Community Fund. Sure. We had a very have you like you know vision for mm -hmm. it. So the fact that you have those kinds of resources, two million dollars a year to offer folks working right. on cutting edge of change, is pretty unusual. It is, especially for a community this size. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, we've been lucky in terms of our profitability over the years and uh, probably not as much as it used to be, obviously, with the change in the, in the whole industry. But uh, we were able to support a lot of programs, and, uh, and we try to spread the money out to, to small places like mm -hmm. this. Uh, which is sometimes a, a lifesaver for them. Exactly. But then we've also, you know, contributed very heavily, like the Monona Terrace and you know things like that. So uh, we just got the two-minute warning. That's so. what I thought. But <laughs> we, we'll, and we, we may be able to continue a little bit into a postscript conversation in a second. But I just want to give you both a chance, uh, just to reflect on where you hope this paper will be. Say, well, we could go a hundred years down the road. But let's try but ten for starters, Dave. <laughs> well, I'm I'm hoping that uh, we can, uh, you know, we're going to have to change with the way the our environment is changing. It's uh, and who knows what the technology will be 20, 30, 40 years from now. So look at some of John's 18 books to figure yeah, that out. Yeah, correct, yeah. correct. <laughs> and uh, and you know, I'm hoping that we'll be able to be a major news source in Madison, a major. Uh, uh, influencer in Madison that we, uh, you know, our, our voice will still be uh, uh, very important and uh, we'll be able to continue to uh, crusade for 
what's good. So do the new realities of journalism permit that? We're really worried that journalism mm -hmm. is falling off the face it of the is, earth. It is, I know, uh, especially print journalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I think you know we have to we have to evolve with the way the. Uh, uh, the, the whole media is, is evolving this week. John? Just as farmers whine about the weather, journalists whine about the end of journalism. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always been the case, trust me, the they've, been, they've been putting up the death notices for a very long time. Um, so in the last year, are you encouraged by the way? In some ways the press has rallied in no, the face I'm of the No, I'm not time? Encour not really? encouraged by the okay. D.C. press. Right, I think the right. D.C. press you know, they just had the White House Correspondents' Dinner, and then they were all apologizing because somebody wasn't nice to Sarah Sanders. So I think the D.C. <laughs> press is, is about as, as awful so as the ever. But but maybe I get, you know, yeah. the Washington Post and the New York Times, but not they're just doing, them. They're are there DC. other, other papers something. in the middle of the country? Are there still people that inspire you that sure. have the right idea? Every are there young journalists day. coming along that are yeah. getting it? Look, my hope is always in the, the papers yeah. out across the country. It's not in Washington. It's not in New York. I think that the, the heart and soul of journalism will always be out here. Uh, there are kids coming into journalism every day who want to do a great job. They're finding new ways to do it. The thing about the Cap Times that's important is that 10 years ago we did go to an online format, but I reject the notion that we're not a daily newspaper. I would argue that we are indeed a daily newspaper exactly as Evu intended it. And the fact is that Evu got into radio, he tried to get into TV. He was always looking at oh, new really? platforms. Yeah. And, and I think Evu would have been straight on into the, the internet and saying, you know, let's do everything we can. And so here's my bottom line on all of this, and the one counsel I would give. I think that, that it's whether a newspaper or a, or a news operation has a heart and soul, right? Yep. And, and if you've got a heart and soul, then you want to continue to live. Ev, you said at the 50th anniversary of the paper, he didn't say, oh, yeah, we're going to go on for another 50 years. He said the next 50 years are going to be hard, but here's the promise I make. The cap times will always be a voice for economic and social justice and for peace. And the fact of the matter is, that's our editorial stance. We have our news side as well. But my sense is that um, as long as those issues are in play, as long as there are economic and social justice issues in play, as long as there are war and peace issues in play, the cap times will exist. And it won't just exist on the periphery. It will be a bold, bold institution. To take two cases in point, is this the paper, if William W. and Elliot Marius were around today, would they be proud of where the paper is, where it's going? I think so. I, I think, uh, they, as John said, I think uh, Mr. Every would have embraced this. Uh, Elliot was a traditionalist like I am, I guess. But well, we uh, all would love to be printing. Yeah, every we'd day. all love yeah, to be, yeah. you know, print and print every day. But uh, and I, I think Elliot, Elliot would call, uh, would call me often, uh, you know, after he left as as the editor and. Uh, would tell me, uh, you know, that he thinks we're doing the right things, that we're, you know, and uh, it always meant a lot. Yeah. And uh, it still does. Well, on that note, we have to end for today. But uh, again, uh, thanks so much for going to address. Uh, Dave Zweifel and John Nichols are the co authors of A Proudly Radical Newspaper Century Long Fight for Justice and for Peace, The Capital Times, A Hundred Year History. We begin to scratch the surface of that, but I hope we gave you at least a few highlights. Get this book, and I think you'll be inspired by its nonlinear, compelling, wonderful narrative. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll inspire you, I think, as we, as we look to the future. Thank you so much, John thank Nichols you, and John. James Weefel. And thank you, thank as you. always, to the generous support of the Evu Foundation and, and all the folks at the Sunbury Media Center. To, our, to you, our viewers, and uh, have a great week.